Harvard University's motto, Veritas, stands for truth. It is a principle to which we are committed as a community of Harvard alumni. Over the past few years, we have seen, experienced, and fallen victim to countless assaults on truth. The onslaught on veracity was manifest in rhetoric counseling against caution in the pandemic that has claimed over 600,000 lives, disproportionately those of people of color. It was likewise visible in the narrative surrounding racial injustice, a concept consistently challenged until we bore collective witness to the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer. The Harvard Alumni Association Anti-Racism Working Group was born of the suffering caused by these twin pandemics, but specifically the group was called to action to combat anti-Black racism. The Anti-Racism Working Group has endeavored to galvanize the resources of the Harvard alumni community in an effort to end racism in our communities. While this was born out of a focus of, on anti-Black racism, the lessons learned through our work are applicable to all situations in which people are hurt or disparaged simply because of their identity. It is our hope that anti-racism work will become part of the air we breathe as the Harvard community that will flow through all that we do in every aspect of our lives. Through the work of this committee, we hope to advance that mission by empowering Harvard alumni to take up the mantle of allyship in this fight and to engage in critical conversations within their communities in order to oppose systemic racism. Recognizing the extraordinary agency of the Harvard alumni community and our collective power to impact change, we have provided here a guide for your alumni community on contentious communications. To that end, we are going to hear from my classmate, Tim McCarthy, on how to navigate hard conversations, whether they occur at the dinner table or in the classroom. It is our hope that the tools we are sharing today can be used to stop destructive and racist behaviors to make the Harvard community a more effective and compassionate place for learning and for living. We believe the truth of Dr. Martin Luther King's words the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. We will fight to fortify this trajectory, but we must act now. Please share with us your experience in engaging with this work and feel free to email us at alumnieducation at harvard.edu. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy. I'm so very happy to be here uh, as part of an official HAA program, Harvard Alumni Association. I, I used to have a leadership role in the Alumni Association as the vice president of the Alumni Association, also secretary of the HAA executive committee for many, many years. And one of the things that I'm really thrilled about, even though I no longer hold any of those positions, is the way that the Alumni Association is really broadening and deepening the work that it's doing around these issues. Uh, I was part of a, a program a couple weeks ago that the new anti-racism working group had put on um, where we addressed some of these very issues and actually they asked me to come in at that uh, session to talk a little bit about our experiences with that Facebook group this summer for our class. And so I'm really thrilled that the HAA is really leaning into and diving into this work in this time. As Michael said, this is um, among the most polarized moments in uh, modern American history, maybe ever in American history. We'll talk about that in a, in a little bit more in a second. And we are having a series of reckonings around issues of racial justice, around issues of public health, around issues of the political future of democracy in our country, of voting rights, um, civil rights, and, and so forth. And so almost everywhere we turn right now, we are experiencing uh, contentious communication or challenges about how to connect across lines of difference, how to have productive conversations, how to navigate unproductive conversations. And so I'm really uh, happy to be here with all of you today. I should say that this is one of the topics that I teach in my arts of communication course. And increasingly over the years, I have found not just in the last six months or eight months, but over the course of the last decade and a half, I have found that this topic is the topic that my students are most keen to engage and most keen to learn and to really wrestle with. And as someone who does some consulting and training and workshops and so forth in the realm of leadership and communications, increasingly so these days, the hottest topic that I get asked to talk about is literally how to communicate when the heat goes up. 
how to deal with, with contentious communication. So this is really on everyone's mind. It's on my mind. And I want to begin right now by saying that even though I do teach this course and I have some things to say about this issue, I myself wrestle with this. I myself struggle with this. I'm, I'm a professor and a scholar and a teacher, but I'm also a citizen and I'm also an activist. And I also live in a diverse family and a diverse community and a diverse society and culture. And these are not easy things. These are the, among the hardest things that we have to do, not just when it comes to communication or leadership, but just living. And so I want to be mindful and honest right up front that I too struggle with this. And so I'm here to learn as well. The fact that we had, you know, hundreds of people sign up for this seminar only suggests even further my point or confirms even further my point that people are interested in this and they really want to know what we're doing. Let me start with a definition, and this is a provisional definition of what I mean when I say contentious communication. Contentious communication is an interactive encounter. It can be either public or private where conflict arises, some form of conflict arises due to say personal differences uh, or political disagreements or both or a combination of those things and where debate often gets heated and where it sometimes gets out of control. And I wanna just highlight a couple of pieces of this parts of this definition. The first is the interactive encounter piece. I say on the very first day of my communications course that all communication is about relationships. It's about how individuals and groups of people communicate to various audiences in, in private and in public. So the first thing that we have to think about when we're thinking about any kind of communication is how do people interact with each other and use words and language and symbols and all of those things, gestures, their bodies to do that work. So all communication is about relationship. And as a result of that, you have to know yourself and your audience even before you engage, hopefully, ideally, in the, any kind of in communication encounter. The second thing I wanna mention is that there's a relationship oftentimes between contentious communication this kind of communication and spontaneous communication, which means communication that you're not necessarily prepared for. It sort of sneaks up on you, right? It takes you by surprise. You're at the holiday dinner and some, you know, uncle or aunt or father or mother or person in your family says something that you weren't expecting. Or you find yourself in a classroom setting or a workplace setting or at a bar or a restaurant where something happens that you weren't expecting and you have to figure out how to navigate that spontaneous encounter. And sometimes that spontaneity increases and amplifies the contention. Sometimes when we're not ready for the heat and we don't know what to say when things get heated, the contention becomes even more threatening or more severe or more amplified. And so there's a relationship between contention uh, and spontaneity. And then the last thing I want to mention is exactly that heat and that control. When these things happen, when we find ourselves in the realm of contentious communication, we find ourselves feeling a certain set of emotions or reactions that can be physiological and psychological. And so we can feel the heat. Sometimes we literally feel the heat rising in our bodies and we feel like we are lacking control of the situation as a result of that. And so I wanna emphasize the heat and the control because so much of communication is emotional. And it's those emotions that sometimes can serve us well, and also those emotions can be in some ways the engine for disaster. And so I wanted to emphasize uh, that too. And then the last thing I want to emphasize is the public or private, that we can have contentious encounters, contentious communication in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, in the privacy of our relationships or our families or our homes. And we can also have these things on a grander stage, a more public kind of encounter in the workplace, in a political debate, on social media, etc. So this definition encompasses all of those things. One of the things that I talk to my students about, in part because I have a background, I was trained as a historian of politics and social movements, and I focus on politics and social movements, both in the United States and abroad. And I'm housed, and I have been housed at the Kennedy School for 13 years now, at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. So I've been influenced as a, a teacher and practitioner of communications and leadership by both social movement frameworks and histories and by human rights ideals and aspirations and, and norms. And so I developed this 
rights and responsibilities of communication for my students that I'd like to share with you. I want to be clear that though this is influenced by social movement frameworks and human rights frameworks, that when we talk about, whenever we talk about rights and responsibilities, even when we're talking about communication or we're talking about justice or anything else, rights and responsibilities are often aspirational. They're often ideals that don't necessarily always exist in real time and real practice. So I want to be clear about that. But let me just run through these four sets of rights and responsibilities. First of all, we have the right to speak and we have the responsibility to tell the truth. And again, this work comes from my teaching of students at the Kennedy School, the Ed School, the Business School at Harvard, who are going out into the world to be leaders in the private sector, the public sector, the educational sector. Uh, and so I really do believe, and we, we talk a lot in the class about what it means to tell the truth and the responsibility that we have to do so as leaders in the world. So we have the right to speak and we have the responsibility to tell the truth. We have the right to be heard and we have the responsibility to listen. We have the right to claim space, to take up space, and we also, I think, have the responsibility to share space as much as we can. And we have the right to walk away, and I'll get back to this later on, especially in these contentious communication settings. We have the right to walk away and the responsibility to do no harm. And so as we think about contentious communication in particular, I think it's really important for us to think about the balance and relationship between these rights and these responsibilities as I've articulated them here. A couple of additional points about this. Again, these are ideals and aspirations, not always realities or everyday practices. Certainly in societies that value free speech and value democratic discourse and debate, and civil discourse and debate, the right to speak and so forth is, is sometimes easier to access and easier to claim. And so more authoritarian or anti-democratic or undemocratic societies are harder to assert and to embrace that right to speak and claim space, the freedoms that in some ways are articulated in this set of rights and responsibilities. Another thing that I'd like to point out is that in my class, and I'm happy to send around a list of bibliography of resources after the seminar today, um, I start my class with a book by Thich Nhat Hanh, who is uh, a Buddhist monk who is uh, a kind of guru of sorts for a whole range of things. And there's a book that he wrote called The Art of Communicating, which is the book that I start my class with. And he articulates two important things in that book, which, which build into and inform these rights and responsibilities that I've just outlined. First, is he talks about the importance of loving speech, of loving speech, of trying to muster the words that are going to be productive, generative, not harmful, not words that do violence. And he talks about the way that language can do violence to other people, either through prejudicial, racist, xenophobic, homophobic, misogynistic language. Uh, or just language that is disrespectful or dismissive of people. He also talks, the other part, almost the yin and the yang of, of communication, of the art of communicating, he talks about deep listening. And he actually introduces deep listening before loving speech. He argues that we have to listen deeply, listen with empathy, listen with intention, listen with the desire to understand and to seek to understand others before we can figure out what words we're going to do. And then if we don't do that deep listening, then we actually are more likely to engage in violent or disrespectful or harmful speech. And so Thich Nhat Hanh's our ideas about loving speech and deep listening as yoked together as part of the project of communicating artfully is very important. I also emphasize to my class, and obviously we will send out a list of resources. All the people I'm going to kind of name check or name drop during this webinar, we'll make sure that we send out a bibliography of resources and links after the seminar. I always say to my students is the relation between leadership and communication that even if we're not the head of something, head of a corporation, the head of a, of a government, the head of a, a nonprofit or, or some kind of organization, there still is a responsibility to model a certain kind of behavior and practice when it comes to communication in the world. And so I talk to my students a lot about the relationship between communication, particularly contentious communication uh, and the leadership. And then the last thing I want to say before we move to the next slide is that we have to believe as communicators 
that we have something to say, that we have to believe that what we have to say has value, that it should be heard that we do have the right to be heard and to claim space, that we do have the freedom to speak and to walk away, right? We have to believe in ourselves as communicators. That's where the confidence comes from. We can only claim these rights and practice these responsibilities if we believe that we're valuable and that our values have value. And so I wanna make sure that we think about that as we're moving forward as well. Why can't we all just get along? We've heard that quote, it's a very prescient and important one in this particular time right now. And I have a couple of things that I wanted to mention about why I think we can't all just get along. <laughs> the first is that reality bites, that we're living in a really difficult time, that the world kind of sucks right now. And I want to be really clear about that, right? There's not a lot of, not a lot of good happening in the world, depending on where you are. Maybe it's better in some places than others. But, you know, I, I, from per, speaking personally, in the United States right now, in the middle of this global pandemic and this election season and this racial reckoning and all of this economic and educational and environmental uncertainty, right, kind of sucks, right? We're not at our best right now. And so there is a world in which part of the reason why we can't get along is because the world is exploding all around us. We're living, it's certainly here in the United States, in the midst of a convergence or a cacophony of crises. <laughs> and so, and that plays itself out both in actual reality and virtual reality. The actual reality is the fact that we, according to public opinion data and polling data, have never been as polarized as we are on as many things as we are right now in the modern history of the United States. The Gallup poll, which was the first national public opinion poll that was taken in 1935, if you look at longitudinal polling data from 1935 to 2020, we're more polarized today on a whole range of issues than we've been at any time since the Gallup poll was invented in 1935. We are deeply polarized and deeply divided, and that manifests itself in all sorts of ways. There's also a virtual reality component to this, which is that social media has come to dominate the way that we consume information, circulate information, create information, that we live increasingly in silos and bubbles on social media, that we live at great distances from ourselves, particularly during the fact of a global pandemic where we're socially and physically distant from ourselves, and this has become reality. We're also increasingly polarized in virtual reality because of the proliferation and the pandemic of misinformation and conspiracy theories that are circulating much more widely now now on social media than ever before. There's all sorts of research on social media and misinformation and conspiracy theories uh, that suggest that we're at peak all of those things right now. And that is also creating a kind of virtual reality crisis for us. So reality bites both in actuality and in virtual space, and that's real. The second reason why we all can't just get along is the world is not a safe space. Oftentimes in academia, we talk about um, safe spaces, as classrooms as safe spaces where people feel safe and secure, they can bring their best selves, they can be respected, et cetera. And that is an ideal that we try to abide by. But the classroom is not the real world. We live in a world that is unsafe. It's full of inequality. It's full of racism and other kinds of prejudices. It's full of unfreedoms and discriminations and violences. That's not to be a, a sort of Timmy Downer, but it's real. And we have to reckon with the fact that the world is not a safe place. And for pe different people, experience that unsafety, that violence, discrimination, inequality, unfreedom in a whole wide variety of ways. And this gets in the way sometimes of us getting along, because in some ways we're not positioned or structured to get along. Another reason why we don't get along is that when we call for civility, which is a noble goal, that we should be civil to one another, that we should be agreeable and not disagreeable, that we should be respectful and not disrespectful, that's all to the good. But sometimes when people call for civility in the context of when someone might be justifiably angry, right? If you have just witnessed the police killing of another unarmed black person, right? You are justifiably angry. If you have just experienced some kind of discrimination in some way, you have a justifiable anger and you have the right, again, to articulate that anger and calls for civility in those moments, right? Sometimes can be experienced by the people who are legitimately and justifiably angry as a cudgel. 
there's an article that I'll send around that, that is entitled this, When Civility Becomes a Cudgel. And sometimes these calls for civility, which may be well-intentioned, are actually deeply uncivil in their impact, if not their intent, because they serve as a form of silencing of legitimate anger, legitimate emotion, a legitimate grievance, alienation, etc. I gave a morning prayers uh, chapel on this last year, and I can send that around as well. Also, one of the reasons why we can't just all get along is that conflict is sometimes a catalyst for good things. The Civil War, as terrible as it was and as violent as it was and as treacherous as it was, led to the abolition of slavery, led to the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, which abolished slavery and gave people equal citizenship and protection under the law and led to universal manhood suffrage for black and white men. Right? Sometimes conflicts, like during the 1960s, during the Great Depression, during the Civil War, during the American Revolution, during our own moment, can be a catalyst for a kind of illumination of the injustices and unfreedoms and inequities in society. Sometimes conflict actually drives progress. And so we shouldn't necessarily just think of conflict as always bad. Sometimes it can be a catalyst for some of the most transformative and revolutionary things we have. Another reason why we can't all get along, simply put, is we're not all the same. There's a vast diversity, lots of differences, lots of intersections that we all embody, and that is important to recommend too. And it's one of the reasons why sometimes we don't get along. And then finally, the stakes are high. The stakes are really, really high right now. We are having big reckonings about race and policing and white supremacy and anti-Black racism. We're having so much we're having big debates about voting rights, big debates about immigration, deportation, children in cages, big debates about the future of reproductive rights and freedom in the Supreme Court, the future of LGBTQ rights, the future of democracy itself. The stakes are high right now, and that's one of the reasons why I think we can't all get along, because we may have different ideas about precisely where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. I wanted to mention briefly um, what I think some of that I've sort of referenced this already, but some of the sources of our contention. The sources of our contention come from a kind of who, where, when, how, and what we are. Who we are is sometimes a source of contention, our identity or identities, the intersections of all the different things that make us who we are. And sometimes the prejudices that exist in society or the perceptions or misperceptions about certain kinds of identities uh, lead to contentious conversations and communication because there's deep and sometimes willful misunderstanding as it relates to identity that exists in the world. Sometimes our contention is rooted in who we are in terms of ideology, our worldview, how we think about the world and how that's shaped by religion or our family structures or geography or our class or socioeconomic backgrounds, our racial backgrounds, etc. And so identity and ideology, the things that make up who we are, who we are in terms of our person and how we view the world in terms of our perspective um, are often sources of contention, particularly when they come into conflict. Where and when we are are also sources of contention. We are not all positioned in the same way in any given society. And we find ourselves in many different situations, no matter what our station. And so we have to think when we're in contentious communication settings and encounters, we have to think about how those systemic positionings and how those situational changes affect how we're communicating at any given time. I'm positioned in society in a particular kind of way. I'm a professor at Harvard. A lot of people listen to me because of that. Is that fair? Maybe not. Right? But I know that I'm positioned in a way that someone who's not a professor at Harvard is not positioned. I also find myself in different situations. When I'm in the classroom, I communicate differently than when I'm at home with my husband, or when I'm out for a drink or singing Whitney Houston on karaoke with Michael Lewis. Right? It, and it's different from where, when I show up in political debates or on panels and forums and these kinds of things. So when and where we are are also sometimes sources of contention. How we are, what we've experienced in our life, the rich tapestry of our human experience and the emotions that attend that, whether we feel sad or fearful or angry or hopeful or, or, or loving or, or hateful at any given moment, how we are, what we've experienced and what we're experiencing emotionally in any given situation is also sometimes at the root of contention. And finally, what we think we know, what the facts are or what the facts aren't, 
and one, several of you brought questions to bear in the, the pre-questions where you asked me about, you know, what do we do in a world where facts are under dispute, where we don't even have the same facts or the same news? That has become the misinformation. The fact that we get our news from very different places have become also sources uh, of deep, deep, deep intention. And then one other thing I wanted to mention and put, a, put, a, put a, a point on is that sometimes I mentioned prejudices and perceptions, that oftentimes the way that we live in the world, um, that, that some of the contention comes to the fact that we have certain perceptions or prejudices about people because they're different from us, whether they're ideologically different or they're different in identity or in social position, et cetera, that we sometimes have bring prejudices to bear. And the, the, the kicker here, and my, my colleague Mazreen Banaji and others here at Harvard have done brilliant research on this, is that sometimes, and this is really, really tough, we don't even know that we bring the prejudices and perceptions and misperceptions we have to bear on our encounters. That sometimes we find ourselves in an argument because we, are, we have implicit bias that is manifesting itself in a moment where we don't think we're being racist, but we've said something that is definitely racist in terms of how it's being perceived, landed, et cetera, by other people that we may be in an argument with. And so we have to be mindful of all of these things. Next slide, Angela. You've all heard of the fight or flight response when faced with a threat or faced with an attack or faced with some kind of perceived threat to your person or your existence, that there is a, a hormonal secretion, a hormonal impact, a physiological impact that leads us to have a whole series of psychological responses. Anxiety, aggression, fear, anger, a sense of a loss of control. And that leads animals and human beings who are animals to flee or to fight. That if there's fear and anxiety, they might flee. If there's aggression, loss of control, they might fight. And so we, we know the fight or flight response, and that happens too when we are in contentious communication settings. I wanna to add to that two other F words. Sometimes we flee, sometimes we fight, sometimes we freeze. We don't know what to say. We can't find the words. And sometimes we fumble, we find the wrong words. We, we know, we think we know what to say, but what we say is actually awkward, it's unproductive, et cetera. So when we're thinking about contentious communication, we have to think about, are we, we have to do a self-reflection about whether or not we're more inclined by our own nature to fight or to flee, and whether or not we're inclined based on experience to freeze or fumble, or all of these things. My, uh, my suggestion to my students is that we develop a deep understanding of ourselves as tending more to fight or flight, and then we have to develop the skills in the other direction. If we're always a fight person, how do we learn to pick our battles and learn when to walk away or when not to engage? If we're a flight person, especially if we're a public leader, we have positions of authority, people are looking to us for some kind of leadership, how do we lean into or dive into those moments of contention a little bit more bravely and a little bit more effectively? And then how do we develop strategies to not freeze in those moments and to not fumble through the wrong words that may have a, a deleterious impact in that way. I tell my students that we should become more diverse in terms of the portfolio of communication and skills that we bring to these pieces. Now I just wanna give uh, three prompts and we're gonna have breakout rooms right now. Uh, and we're going to, uh, I'm gonna give you three prompts and each group will have three, four, or five people in them. So it'll be a small cohort. And you're gonna be in your breakout groups for 20 minutes. And you're gonna each, each group can select one of these three prompts, or if you get to it, two of them. But here are the three prompts. The first prompt is, think about a recent contentious encounter. Something that happened to you recently that did not go well. A heated exchange, a difficult conversation, a fight with a friend or family member, a conflict with a boss or coworker, some contentious encounter that did not go well. And reflect with your group. So tell that story quickly, briefly, and then think about, reflect on why did it go badly? What went wrong? And try to be as specific as you can. And then to say, to try to reflect a little bit and get people's advice, what could you or they have done differently. Oftentimes in contentious communication, not always, but sometimes in contentious communication, both people are at fault. 
might both people could do something differently to make the encounter more productive. Not always, sometimes it's the fault of one person and not the other. But this is the first problem. Recent contentious encounter that didn't go well, why did it go badly, and then what could you and they have done differently? The second prompt, again, you're gonna choose which one you wanna engage. Think about a value you hold dear. Honesty, family, whatever. Something you consider to be a non-negotiable for which you would be willing to risk something in terms of your personal standing or professional security. Non-negotiable, a value you hold dear is something that you're willing to fight for or risk something for. Share the experience of having to defend it against pushback or opposition. So a value you hold dear, something non-negotiable or worthy of risk, share an experience where you had to defend that value against pushback or opposition, and then engage these questions. How did you communicate your value or values? How did you make it known? What happened when you did, right? Where did the pushback come from, opposition? How did it manifest itself? And what, if anything, could you do more effectively if you were to have that encounter again? That's the second prompt. The third prompt, again, choose one of these three. The third prompt is think about an issue or position you disagree with, something you find yourself debating or fighting about with others, and explain the root of your disagreement or opposition. What is it about that issue or position that is the source of your disagreement? Now consider the issue or position from an opposing perspective, from the other perspective. What is the most compelling argument in its favor? And is there anything that you would be willing to acknowledge or concede about that position or issue that you disagree with? Why or why not? Sometimes there isn't, but sometimes there is. And so I want to push you to think about, is there something, is there any merit in that other position that you might uh, not be in agreement with? So we're going to send you into breakout rooms, 20 minutes, and uh, choose one of these three prompts. Engage with your group, make sure everybody talks. Then we're gonna come back and debrief and I'm gonna ask for some people to report back what you talked about and what you discovered in these sharing and reflections in the breakout room. But I wanted to make sure that we have some time here in the last uh, 10 minutes to just give you some tips and takeaways, some of which will be linked to the examples that have already been shared that you'll have in your kind of toolbox. I always try to end with some, some stuff that people may, may have. So the first thing I wanna say is that whenever you are engaged in contentious communication, especially but any kind of communication, you have to prepare, you have to practice, you have to reflect and you have to return. Meaning that you have to try to figure out how do I prepare for an encounter that I know might be contentious, just like you'd prepare for a PowerPoint presentation at work or a keynote address that you're giving at a conference or a lecture you're preparing or a lesson you're preparing in school or a difficult conversation you know you have to have with your child who's gotten in trouble or what have you. That we need to prepare for these moments as best we can, even though sometimes they sneak up on us. So preparation is really important. Practice is also really important. Doing this, leaning into these contentious conversations when we choose to and when we can and when we feel like we have the energy uh, and the wherewithal to do that. And then once you've had that encounter, sometimes it doesn't go well. Right? Each of the examples that Gina and Raj and Wilda gave were, were examples that had a mixed outcome, a mixed moral or end to the story. It's not always going to end well. Sometimes it doesn't. Often it doesn't, especially in these times. We have to reflect on that. Why didn't it go well? That's why I asked you in the prompts, you know, what could you have done differently? What would you go do again? How could you do it more effectively? What do you think happened here? Doing that kind of reflection, whether it's with another person or people who are there, uh, people you trust, people who aren't gonna be uh, in a fight with you, I think it's really important to reflect on what happened, what you would do differently, how you might approach it more effectively, whether or not it was worth it to begin with, and then return to the battlefield, return to the, to the fray of contention so that you're, you're shaping and sharpening your tools along the way. We can't just do this. We have to actually prepare for it. We need, to, we need to do it. We need to reflect on it and we need to do it again. Let me just offer you uh, 12 quick tips that I'm gonna just go through quickly that I think can help us in these contentious situations. One is to make a plan. We often know 
right? When we're going home for the holidays and we, we have some relative who's going to say something that's going to piss us off, we know that we're going into that situation and that might happen. So make a plan for it. If you're going to a legislative briefing or you're going to a, a faculty meeting or you're going to some place where you know something might come up, make a plan for that. Try to anticipate who's in the room, what might come up, if this comes up, how might you, how might you uh, 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 approach it so that you're not caught off guard. Putting talking points together, sort of drafting out your comments, sort of thinking about how you might respond, developing a kind of contingency plan is really important. Part of making a plan is doing your research, right? People who debate do this all the time. Kamala Harris and Mike Pence have spent the last couple of weeks preparing for the debate on Wednesday. I think they probably would be more prepared uh, than the presidential candidates were. Um, maybe because they weren't super prepared and that, that, that debate didn't go so well. But doing your research is also important. Knowing your facts, being able to figure out what is your best evidence to make the claims and support the claims that you're making. You would never advance an argument in a paper without evidence to cite or footnote if you're making the argument. Same thing goes in contentious communication. You want to be able to know your facts, know your argument, have your evidence lined up, and also, also try to anticipate, and this goes back to making a plan, try to anticipate the arguments and the evident evidence, the facts or the fictions that your opponent or your adversary or the person you're in contention with or people you're in contention with are going to bring. So making a plan and doing your research are very, very important. The third thing you want to keep in mind when you're engaging or you're going to find yourself in a contentious situation is know your role. Sometimes we go into the role as an advocate or an activist. We, we want to bring a sense of righteousness. We're trying to represent a position, a group of people, a community demand. Sometimes we go into contentious communication as a person who is trying to be the negotiator, trying to be the peacemaker, trying to really resolve the tensions and so forth. You will use a different set of tactics and strategies if you are someone who's going in as the advocate or activist than whether you go in as a negotiator and a peacemaker. Right? Sometimes we want to be the bridge builders and the boundary crossers. Sometimes we want to be the people who are extending the olive branch or are trying to understand the other side, doing our best to do that work. Those roles of bridge crossing and boundary or bridge building and boundary crossing are going to be different than if we're going in to speak truth to power, right? To shock the other side into recognition or to make clear that the demands are here. Sometimes we draw the line in the sand and sometimes we cross the line in the sand to be boundary crossers. Those are different roles. Have a sense of which role you're playing and those roles might shift. There are some times where I'm the activist and the shocker and the, the righteous uh, truth to power speaker, right? And then sometimes I'm the bridge builder, I'm the boundary crosser, I'm the community builder, I'm the peacemaker, I'm the negotiator. And different situations are different, are going to call for different tactics and strategies. So understand the diversity of those roles that you can play and be clear about what your role is in this moment. Another fourth thing that to keep in mind is to breathe and pause. One of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're in a fight or they're in a contentious communication setting or they're in a, in a setting that they didn't expect. It's some kind of, it's a combination of contentious and spontaneous communication. Sometimes what happens is that we feel the threat, we feel attacked, we feel misunderstood or disrespected. We want to fight right away. We want to go right back at the person. Or when something comes up that we didn't expect, we get flustered and we just start talking. That's where we start to fumble, right? When I talked about that, when the F words are, that's when we start to, that's when we started to fumble. The breathing and pausing, which I'm not doing a lot of here as we race to the end of the webinar, uh, can be your friends. Take a deep breath before you, um, yes, breathing is under threat with COVID. That is absolutely true. Um, but taking a breath in the best of times uh, or, or, or settling yourself, right? Getting in touch with your body, calming down, trying to maintain your composure in these moments, and to pause and think about what you want to say. I always say, let's think about where I want to land after this, this attack or this pushback or this opposition is coming to me. How do I take a moment, a beat or two, one second, two seconds, three seconds, think where I want to go, and then land 
your point. You don't have to say everything in that moment. You just have to figure out what the one thing is that will be your entry point. So breathing and pausing, calming yourself down, maintaining composure will help you in every instance in a contentious situation or a spontaneous situation. Using your body, right? Using your body to, to connect with people, to open yourself up to people. Sometimes to, to, to close off to people. So if you're not happy with something, you can also use your body to express that. But your body language is a language itself. Words and, and so forth, they articulate things, but so do our bodies. If we're rolling our eyes or we're, we're looking off to the distance or we're closed off physically or we're turned around or we're on our phones, all of those things signal something to the person or people that you're in conflict with or in contention with or in conversation with that could actually backfire, right? It, it could indicate to the people that you're not listening, that you don't care about them, you don't respect them, you don't take them seriously. And even if you don't take them seriously, even if you disagree wildly, your body can actually sometimes be a counterweight or a counterforce um, to the, the sort of argument itself, which plays out on the terrain of language and words. So make sure you're thinking about how you're using your body, open or closed, um, rigid or loose, eye contact or not, et cetera, because that stuff can often be the game changer when it comes to contentious communication. Another thing that you wanna to bring to this is to try to listen as carefully as you can, again, that deep listening, and then replay or restate what you've heard. So that when you're in a contentious communication situation, it sometimes helps to say, you know, I, I just heard you say this, and I'm not sure that I got it right. Did I get you, did I hear you properly? Right, that's what I heard. And then say, well, now that I have confirmed that I hear you properly, I disagree with that, here's why. But replaying based on deeper careful listening can indicate to your adversary and to your opponent, to the person you're in contention with, that you're, act that you're, you're taking them seriously enough to actually listen to what they have to say so that you can replay it and repeat it. Another thing that is a, sometimes a double-edged sword is to make it personal. And this is where the power of stories as I mentioned with Wilda, the power of stories can be your friend, right? Your story about how you came to believe something or the values, the why question behind your position or your perspective or your idea or your argument, the stories of other people that you might represent, people you work with, communities that are disempowered that have sent you to a particular setting to be the representation of that group of people, right? Sometimes you're the only one of your kind in a setting and so you're already assumed to be speaking on behalf of everybody like you whether that's fair or not or just or not but making it personal can be helpful because it's harder not impossible it's harder to attack the person uh, than it is the idea or the opinion or the perspective so making it personal can be very very helpful particularly uh, with the power of storytelling of others or yours that said making it personal is a double-edged sword because when it gets personal it gets emotional when it gets personal it gets proximate when it gets personal it sometimes gets political so you have to figure out when you talk about yourself and tell your own stories or tell the stories of people you care about or people that you're representing, are you able to do that in a way where your emotions are not going to be your enemy but your friend? And that's really important. Another thing to, to keep in mind is to try to find common ground on contested terrain. Again, Wilda, this is something that you were doing when you were going to that lawmaker and trying to say, okay, let me try to, let me try to, to, to communicate with you in a shared identity or something that we might have in common that you might be willing to sort of understand. Sometimes when we're on contested terrain, we're so focused on what divides us and differentiates us and what is the source of conflict and contest that we don't spend any time thinking about what we have in common. Maybe the only thing we have in common is that we're part of the same family. Maybe the only thing we have in common is that we're super passionate about this issue on two sides of the divide. But at least we care, right? Passion is a sign and an indication that you care about something. That could be common ground. Try to figure out when you're on contested terrain what that common ground is and name it and try to use that as a point of connection. Even if you're fighting, it will help, particularly if there's a personal connection, it will help. 
call in rather than calling out. I don't want to get too into call out culture because I think there's a, a time and a place for calling people out when they're being terribly unjust and prejudicial and hateful and, and violent and all that. Certainly there's a role for calling people out, but we don't have to call people out as the default option in every conflict or every point of contention. Sometimes calling people in saying, you know, I have a question about what you just said. I'm not sure I understand what you just said. I would like to, I'm not sure that we're both coming at this from the same assumption. Where did you get that information? Asking people questions, inviting people into a conversation, even in the context of contention, can be a way to do that. And there are all sorts of ways that I'm happy to circulate to you um, that, that you can use to, to do this. I, and then just very quickly at the end here, last three points. I always tell my students that you can be fierce and generous at the same time. To tell someone that you respect them while telling them that you disagree with them is not, is not, um, is, is not a contradiction. You can, you can be generous in conceding a point, in acknowledging a person, in, in hearing someone's story, and also be fierce in the way that you stand your ground the way that you stand by your values and speak your truth. It is possible to be both and fierce and generous. They're not opposing qualities or characteristics or rhetorical, uh, rhetorical strategies. And then the last two points, shift the setting. If this is not a productive setting, and this is particularly true on social media, which Michael and I had to deal with and are still dealing with, with our class on our Facebook page, Shifting the setting, taking it offline. That's one of the things that we did was we reached out one-on-one -on -one individually, our class leadership to the classmates who were in the most fierce contention and the most divisive kinds of, of fights on our Facebook page. And we had one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. And in almost every case, it helped because we took it offline. We had Zoom calls, we did FaceTime calls, we, we did it over email, we had phone calls, we took a walk in the park. Right? We did something in a different space so that the contested terrain of social media became a more, more, um, a more generative and a more uh, effective terrain in real time and real space. And so shifting the setting, if this ain't working, let's take it somewhere else. Or if this ain't working today, let's do it tomorrow. Or you know what, let's take a pause for now. Let's follow up next week when we're both feeling a little bit better. Maybe we've had too much to drink. Let's talk about this over breakfast two days from now. Right? Shifting the setting can sometimes sh change and shape the contention and can, can, can alter the dynamics. And then lastly, and this gets to the point that I made early on when I was talking about rights and responsibilities, pick your battles. Right? If you feel that there is no way to achieve the objective that you want because someone has a whole different set of alternative facts, because they're not willing to listen to you, because they're racist as hell, maybe they're not the person that you want to have a battle with. Maybe you want to avoid them altogether. I have lost friends in my lifetime, increasingly in the last six or eight months. There are people that I'm not going to talk to until after the election. There are relatives I might not want to have Christmas dinner with when we can finally do that again. Pick your battles and not expend your energy, right? We all have a limited amount of energy and it's not worth fighting over and over and over again, hitting your sort of head on the rock with people who are never going to move. If you don't think you can move somebody, you don't think you can achieve your objectives, you have no responsibility to engage in that contention or conflict. It's okay to avoid it. It's okay to say, nope, not today. It's okay to walk away when you're in the middle of a situation that you know isn't going to get any better. And so I want to be really clear that as much as I want to encourage all of us, especially in this time, to develop these skills, to, to, to practice what we're doing, to reflect on it, to put these kinds of tactics and strategies in place and to lean in to these types of contentious communication scenarios, I also want us to all keep in mind that we have to take care of ourselves, right? And that sometimes language is violent and sometimes conflict is abuse, but not all language and not all conflict are those things. And so we need to be more discerning, but we also need to be more engaged in how we navigate this terrain. Because if there's one thing the last six to eight months has shown us, it is that contentious communication ain't going away. It's only going to become more of a challenge. And so um, with that, I will, I will close. Thanks everybody.